We've got an unusual story to tell you. How seniors struggling to deal with the loss of loved ones in Boynton Beach, Florida, found themselves depicted on the big screen. But more important than any movie is how these seniors have been able to help one another overcome their sorrow through what's known as a bereavement club. If you're trying to cope with loss, it's something that just might work for you as well. Let's see how Hollywood portrayed it and how it looks in real life. Sarita Butwin made her big screen debut in the movie The Boynton Beach Club. She played the long ago high school crush of Harry, a widower learning how to date and socialize again after losing his wife of many years. Holy cow. What? The woman there is Lucille Parisi, but the high school with her. She was a real knockout in 10th grade. Yes, yeah, she still is. Why don't you go on over, say hello, and you'll get lucky. Harry takes a chance on love and asks Lucille Parisi to dance with him. Sarita's husband remembers how much fun his wife had as an extra in the film. Sarita enjoyed every single, she would have paid them to get in that role. That's how much she enjoyed it. Shortly after the filming, Sarita Butwin was diagnosed with lung cancer. She died in January 2006, just a few months before the film's release. She was a good mother, a great wife, and a fabulous grandmother, and a lot of fun. She, every day she would say, did I make you laugh today? Neil and Sarita were married for almost 46 years. Every day since her death has been a challenge for him. Isn't it ironic that I'm living through that whole experience that was in the movie? The Boynton Beach Club is a story about grief and the courage to live and possibly love again. The movie chronicles the lives of Harry, Jack, Lois, Marilyn, and Sandy, residents of a South Florida retirement community. They attend a weekly bereavement club meeting to help Welcome, them cope Marilyn. with the deaths of loved ones. I'd like to know how to deal with my anger. My husband died in an accident. A stupid and senseless accident. It just makes me so angry sometimes. If the dialogue seems realistic, that's because it is. The film is based on real life experiences. My wife Phyllis was my companion and uh, best friend for uh, 45 years. The inspiration for the movie came about when a close friend of mine named Marilyn died, and her husband was absolutely devastated. Um, after several months, he went to a bereavement group here in Florida, in Boynton Beach. Florence Seidelman, who lives part of the year in the real-life Boynton Beach retirement community, thought the bereavement club could be a good subject for a movie. She shared the idea with her daughter, Susan Seidelman, who produced the Madonna movie, Desperately Seeking Susan, and the pilot episode of the TV program, Sex and the City. She said, Mom, you've been pitching ideas to me for years. If you think that this is such a good idea, you write a script, you write the movie. So Florence did just that. Six months later, she presented her daughter with a 130-page outline. Florence has been married to her husband, Mike, for 56 years. Writing the script opened her eyes to what life is like for single older people today. Well, the women are very bold. Um, I was, that surprised me. The idea of giving cards to a man at a bereavement group or going to a party and seeing a single man and handing him a card. My card. Elaine, our group leader, encourages us to do this. If you're lonely and you just want to talk to someone, call me. Much of the movie is drawn from Florence Seidelman's observations of a real life bereavement club in Boynton Beach. Coordinator Bobby Kraft has been helping the newly widowed for six years in the Bereavement Support Group program at the Alpert Jewish Family and Children's Service. The goal of the group is to provide people with a safe place to come to share their feelings, to drop the facade at the door, so to speak, to really be able to say what they're feeling, to vent. I was on antidepressants. I needed it, and I find that I'm weaning myself off. And it's because of your group, Bobby. Without Bobby's group, I could not do it. Support groups meet for 12 weeks initially. 
people must wait at least six weeks after the death of a spouse to enroll. There are also follow-up groups, such as this one. Women make up the overwhelming majority of group members, but over the last year, Bobby has seen more men participating. Does everybody feel that they are healing? Slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly. 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 Very slowly. Very slow, very slow for us. Mm -hmm. and then back. Emotions can be very raw at these meetings. I have still not forgiven God for uh, the unexpected turn of events between my mother and my husband. Both of them were unexpected in a short time, too. Lenny Backer is dealing with a double loss. His wife and daughter died within six months of each other. So it's, it's really difficult for me right now. Does it help being here, Lenny? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it helps. You know, you know that you're not alone and that other people are going through the same troubles you have. Most of the people who attend the meetings do so after hearing about them by word of mouth. The group usually consists of people in their 60s and 70s, but Bobby has assisted those as old as age 94. Besides grief, Bobby also addresses practical issues. And if you stay focused on the day that you're in, you can't project into tomorrow and anticipate what may happen that may be bad tomorrow. We talk about Wedding bands. So many times women will come in and they'll say, my friend told me I should be taking off my wedding band. What am I supposed to do? So we talk about that. Is there a time when you're supposed to take off your ring? Clearly the answer is no. It's, it's always at your own comfort level. We talk about the clothing, how to start the process of packing up the clothing, the personal items. We talk about the safety issues in terms of living in your home alone. Bobby says it's important to remember that no two people grieve alike. She encourages the recently widowed to reach out for help. It's also important to let your friends and family know what you need from them. Don't assume that they know what you need. You have to let them know. Even after attending a bereavement support group, most people still have a long road ahead in making peace with their loss. I still cannot have dinner in my kitchen alone where I used to have it with my husband every mm -hmm. night. This is, it's hard work. And most people wind up saying as they come through the support groups that they never realized how difficult this process really is. But Bobby stresses that there is light at the end of the tunnel. When you're able to talk about your loved one without feeling that gut-wrenching pain in the pit of your stomach is generally a good sign that you have worked through your grief. This group, including Lenny, was able to end today's session with a laugh. Many of them also found comfort in Florence Seidelman's movie version of their club. I had one woman who came into my group early on. I, it was during the initial screening. And she said, I saw the Boynton Beach Club. And she said, you know, I walked out of there and it gave me so much hope. Hope that while life may have changed, it does indeed go on. And I, and I figured if God doesn't forgive me, it's OK. We're even. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have a sense of humor. Otherwise. Absolutely. Joining me now to discuss bereavement clubs and dealing with loss is Dr. Gordon Livingston. Dr. Livingston earned his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and trained there in adult and child psychiatry. He is a former Army Ranger who served in the 82nd Airborne Division and earned a Bronze Star for Valor. He is the author of the best-selling book, Too Soon Old and Too Late Smart, 30 True Things You Need to Know Now and also has two other books and numerous articles in national magazines and newspapers. Thank you so much for visiting us, nice Dr. Livingston. Here, Alex. If I may, I know you've had a little bit of loss, quite a bit of loss in your life. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I've lost two sons, and it happened within a 13-month period about 15 years ago. My uh, oldest son, Andrew, who was 22, uh, committed suicide after a three-year struggle with bipolar illness. And uh, soon thereafter, my youngest son, who was only six, Lucas, uh, um, 
uh, developed leukemia and died over about a six-month period. So uh, it was a terrible time for me. In terms of grief, I also know that you spent time in Vietnam and sort of saw what happened over there and how many, you know, people passed away in that situation. Is that where you began to form your coping mechanisms for grief? Well, that, uh, that was my first exposure to uh, a lot of death. And, uh, and so, yes, I began to, to, to think about what it must be like for these families, you know, to get this awful news about their loved ones. Uh, and uh, now we're in another war and, and families are still suffering in the same way. Tell me, what, is, what do you think is the best way when you initially have to deal with grief to handle that? Well, there is no prescribed way to do it. I mean, the first reaction of most people is shock and denial, and and uh, just uh, it takes some time to absorb such catastrophic information, and then only very slowly and with the help of the, of people around them do uh, people gradually come to terms with the reality of what's happened and and begin the process of of mourning, which sure. is, uh, takes a very long time. We're going to come right back and talk more about that. It's time for another break. Stay with us because we'll be back shortly to continue our discussion with Dr. Gordon Livingston about bereavement clubs and other ways to cope with loss. True or false? One's risk of death increases following the death of a spouse. Do you know the answer? Answer. True. According to new research, the risk of death increases 61% for a wife 30 days after the death of her husband and 53% for husbands following the death of a wife. Welcome back. My guest on this part of today's Daily Apple is Dr. Gordon Livingston. He's a psychiatrist and the author of Too Soon Old and Too Late Smart, 30 True Things You Need to Know Now. We're talking about bereavement groups and how to overcome and tra the trauma of losing a loved one. First, let me say, you know, thank you for being here again. And I've just read your book, and it's so fabulous. I would recommend it to all of our viewers. It just brings out kind of the things we know naturally, but it's good to read them and get them reinforced so that you can yeah. live your life with them. That's the reaction I've gotten from lots of people. Most of them are common sense ideas, uh, and, uh, and I just kind of collected them in one place. Sure. Tell me a little bit about, more about grief. How would you define grief? Well, grief is the, is the human reaction to the loss of a loved one. And, uh, and while it goes through a number of, of stages and people feel differently at different times, there's no really prescribed method of going through it and it's a very individual experience, both in its intensity and, in, and its duration, so that no one should expect to go through, uh, you know, anger and denial and, and bargaining and so on in quite the way that, um, uh, that some people think. Uh, there is usually a very great mixture of emotions, and about the best one can say about it is that it's best not to go through it alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and uh, everyone has to go through it at their own pace. There's no right way to do it, and the the result in the end is uh, a kind of softening. Uh, it doesn't go away, and grieving people hate the the word closure because it kind of implies that that, uh, you, that you can reach some state at which all of it is put behind you. And of course, that's not true. Uh, you'll always uh, miss the the person you've lost. So I think those are a few of the generalizations about it, at least. Is it the process that you go through as much as it is the time that goes by? Yes, it is. And, and, uh, and so people need to be reassured. And I think that's what's powerful about these bereavement groups, that uh, need to be reassured that, that whatever they're experiencing is legitimate and, and, uh, and normal and, uh, and, and that they don't have to conform to anyone's timetable about how to do it. I know that the time during the holidays is always a difficult one, and, and also within one year, I guess, every time there's a birthday or something of that nature, you're not spending it together. Why is that particular time, say, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, so difficult on well, people? Well, it heightens the sense of loss, and, uh, and uh, the holidays are family times, and when you've lost someone who's, who's close to you, it's particularly for the first uh, a uh, couple of, of uh, cycles, the first couple of years, it's, uh, it's really important to be aware that, that these are going to be difficult times and you need to have the people that, uh, the, who, who you love who are still here uh, uh, help you. And some people benefit by varying 
their schedules in some way so that they don't find themselves in the same place that they would have been when their loved one was alive. And uh, so people take different kinds of vacations and, 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 uh, and, and try to emphasize that, that their life, they've been changed forever and that they're, they're in a new life mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, trying to maintain my composure, my grandmother, who was my hero, died this year, and <clears throat> I remember being so angry right at the beginning. Why do you get so angry? Well, it's a natural reaction to something that you don't have any control over. Here's this person who, who you cared about, and, and perhaps even more important, who, who you knew cared about you, and, and, uh, and to lose someone like that just seems so unfair and so final and and uh, and so to be angry uh, some people report that they're angry with God for allowing uh, such a thing to happen it's uh, it's a very natural reaction do you think the men and women grieve similarly well I think there's some differences women tend to be more uh, expressive they tend to have bigger support groups and and uh, and tend not to and and men uh, tend to often be in a kind of a a fix-it mode and they're confronted with something that they can't fix so that's that for some men that's a unique uh, uh, sense it produces a, a sense of powerlessness on their part and so I think men and women uh, do go through these experiences differently I find it so interesting how people don't know exactly what to say when someone passes away you know we, we seem to have a lot of trouble even the cards in the store don't exactly catch it how does it do family and friends support well it's uh, many of the platitudes that are used such as uh, uh, he or she is in a better place or uh, it's God's will or uh, um, are, are really inadequate and so but at the same time, there's no prescribed uh, uh, phraseology that's going to console everyone. It's your presence that makes the most difference, and the sense on the part of the bereaved person that they that that they're still of, of value uh, to people, and that uh, and that they have others that they can depend upon. In the uh, package that we just saw, you saw the woman handing her card over. Uh, is there a certain time or a phase, or is it just individual when you can start getting out again? Oh, it is very individual, and, and some people uh, uh, feel th that it takes them longer than others to be ready to uh, get on with things like a, a social life or even, even something simple such as, uh, is it okay to laugh? again uh, and and uh, so we're torn by that loyalty we have to the person who we've lost uh, but the need also and uh, to move on with our lives do you think it's selfish to hold on to grief for you know for others no I, I don't think so I mean I again I, I think that that uh, in the American Psychiatric Association for example uh, draws a line at six months uh, uh, that if you're if you're still uh, feeling acute grief at the end of six months then uh, you're supposed to worry about depression I think that's ridiculous I mean that's much too early uh, and uh, so however long it takes it certainly takes longer than six months and I and I don't feel that anybody should be pressured into feeling as though they have to get on with things so they have to dispose of of, uh, of the deceased person's property or any of those things that, at, until they're ready to do so and I think that's the good thing about the movie is that they emphasize that everybody does this at their own pace. Just really quickly before we close what advice would you give to some of our viewers who might be going through it just right this moment in the early stages? That it's going to soften that, that they're not always going to feel this lacerating pain of early grief and that and that the person uh, who they've lost lives on within them in some important way that that love is never lost not even in death well I want to thank you because you've helped me today <laughs> thanks for being here it's a pleasure